Welcome, Dinesh. Uh, Dinesh Palipana, uh, it's been a while, in, in, I guess, in the making. Thanks for coming on to the program of ABC's of Anesthesia. Um, yeah, it's a real privilege. I, I feel a bit starstruck. You're, you know, you're, you're actually, you're Sri Lankan and you were born like probably maybe in the same hospital as I was. Really? So in I, Candy. I, I was in Peridinium Hospital. So. Yeah, I, I would have been, I was born in Candy, but I double checked the hospital though. Yeah, yeah. My yeah. parents were, I don't know, in uni there and no. that's just what happened. You know, my dad was tutoring my mom. They hooked up, got married. <laughs> How good. Yeah, good, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll give a brief bio of you. Um, it's, it, obviously, it's exceptional. And I, I suspect a lot of people listening have already kind of already know about you, but um, let's let's get into it. Uh, born 84, Australian doctor, lawyer, scientist, and disability advocate. Um, you're the first quadriplegic medical intern in Queensland, Australia, and also the second person with quadriplegia, quadriplegia to graduate as a doctor in Australia and the first with spinal cord injury. Um, and you've been an advocate for medical students with disabilities in Australia where significant barriers existed and also founding Doctors with Disabilities Australia as well. Um, 2021 Queensland Australian of the Year, awarded the Order of Australia Medal in 2019 and also the third Australian to receive the Henry Viscardi Achievement Award in New York in 2019. Um, you've got this book, I'll put the link um, in the show notes um, for Strong, called Stronger and you've got some amazing, um, you know, Richard Harris talks it has very, very complimentary uh, uh, feedback on that, as well as Kurt Fernley. Um, now, Dinesh, before, like, I really want this to be a chat. I mean, you know, yeah. We can chat about anything, um, but essentially, you know, this channel is a nerdy channel about anesthetics and critical care. But I think where it's, you know, I think you're a bit of inspiration because you just make things happen that I think people wouldn't even believe would happen. Um, so I'd probably like to ask you all range of things from kind of the nitty gritty of even how you've modified your practice and IV cannulation and how you create time for yourself with all yeah. the other things you've got to do, but also um, just how you have moved outside of the usual uh, things to get things done. But that's kind of the the yeah bit where I'd like to go but um could you give us a bit of a background about what what happened and your I guess your you know how everything changed and what you had to do to get through medical school and get your internship position yeah for sure and you know what like I I love medicine I love I love being a doctor I love everything about uh what we get to do I, I just think it's a massive privilege and it's the coolest job in the world I think um I'd agree. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, when, uh, and I wasn't one of those guys that uh, grew up wanting to be a doctor. So um, I, I studied law first and then discovered medicine. But when I eventually got to medicine, like, I loved it. I've loved it since yeah. day one. I was having the time of my life. Um, but uh, I had a car accident on the 31st of January, 2010. Mm -hmm. I was uh, driving along... Um, the gateway motorway and it was it was night it was wet uh and my car lost control <laughs> in the wet i wasn't doing anything crazy like i've i've done dumb stuff in cars when i was younger <laughs> but this wasn't that this was I, just i feel like if you're just driving or in a car in sri lanka that's already the, 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 the as crazy as driving gets anyway right exactly, <laughs> exactly. so uh yeah, and uh, my car aquaplane, and uh, I had a rollover that night, uh, and a spinal cord injury uh, as a result. So uh, it's a C six C seven spinal cord injury. I lost the use of my fingers and all function below the chest, uh, and that was the night that I guess I don't know. I wonder if I was. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if everything changed. I mean, everything changed, but I almost wonder if it was the moment where I was reborn. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because you did say this comment, like, you know, obviously watched a lot of the stuff about you um, that's on YouTube and out there um, because it's such a fascinating story. Uh, but you say, like, it, it feels no worse for you. Like, I mean, that, that, that would be like your life improved in many ways. Yeah, and I think it's a trade-off. Like, uh there are things that I've lost, but there are things that I've gained mm -hmm. as well. And I was talking to, so I, I traveled to Sri Lanka where we were both born mm -hmm. after this, after this happened. And I spoke to, I was trying to find, I was trying to make sense of mm -hmm. life and everything at the time. Mm -hmm. So I spoke to many different people. I spoke to like Muslims. I spoke to Hindus. I spoke to all kinds of people. But I remember speaking to a Buddhist uh, 
<laughs> monk at the time. And uh, he said that being born into this world mm-hmm. is a difficult process for for the mother and child. Yeah. And you're kind of suffering from that point on. I mean, that's kind of what the Buddhist yeah. philosophy is, right? <laughs> the dissatisfaction of life constantly. And, uh, yeah. Exactly. So I think the... Um, the accident too, I felt like it was, I was being reborn. It was a hard process. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is a lot that I lost, like the ability to walk, the ability to use my fingers. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I think about how much I've gained as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, you and I are sitting here having a chat. This yeah. would have never happened. Yeah. Uh, There's so many things in life that would have been very different. So um, we all have to make sense of our lives and the world Mm -hmm. and the things that happen. And for me, the way I make sense of it is I think, yeah, I've lost, I lost a bunch of stuff, but at the same time, I I gained a a lot of things as well. So when um, when you went through, like, you know, at the start, everyone was saying, look, there's no way you can really get through medical school. And there's some level of, uh, you know, barking up the wrong tree or Mm. sunk cost fallacy as well, right? Like, did you have a perception that, yeah, look, just got to work really hard at this and just get the right things happening to get through this? Or like, did you ever have a sense of, oh, look, you know, this is, I should just focus on something else. Like, how how did you, is there something that gave you the sense that, yep, you're going to see this through no matter what? I think um, it was more uh, like I thought, I thought, should I do something else? Mm -hmm. I never thought I'm going to do something else. Yeah. But there've been times when I thought, should I, should I, should I practice law? Should I, yeah. uh, should I do all these other things? But like, I really love this. <laughs> you know, um, I'm, uh, whenever I'm at work, I, I, it just doesn't feel like work. Yeah. And it's so interesting. It's so human. Yeah. Um, it's challenging. Mm. Like, so, so I, I really love it. And, and so I did, I just didn't want to let go of that because yeah. I knew I'd regret it forever and there's no room in life for regrets uh and you just got to try right yes try try to reach your dreams so um i remember talking to a friend and i said once i got the opportunity to go back to medicine i said yeah you know i'm gonna try and he said no there's he was like yoda he said there is either do or not (laughs) and there's no try (laughs) just get it done yeah just get it done. So I, I just busted my butt. And also I think the way we think about medicine um, really, uh, you know, is it actually that we're, we have, we have a AI, we have robotics, we have all this stuff, right? <laughs> Are our skills, should they actually be reduced to the procedures that we do? Mm-hmm. Um, or uh, is it more a higher level thing? You know, yeah. Uh, I think our job is to actually think through things and cognitively uh, process stuff and mm-hmm. and be that human base and to use our skills to do that. But is the ability to be a doctor just putting a chest tube in or something like that? I don't know. Yeah. You know, because you can train so many people to do those skills. Absolutely. And it may, I mean, it makes sense. Like when I interact with a doctor. I really care that I'm interacting with a person. I, I I don't know if AI could ever replace that or tech or machine could replace that. And as much as I'm as an anesthetist, pretty, you know, full on into I want to make sure that my skills are, you know, tra- will always be useful. I kind of know that we could probably they've already got really good autopilot anesthetic machines out there. Won't be too long before they've got technical things that do a lot of what we do, whether it's, you know, radiology or it's uh, anesthetics or even surgery. But at the end of the day, there's going to be someone at the interface to really understand a person because we're, you know, what is it? Psychology is just a lot of physiology that you, we don't know yet as well. Like we, we need to know so much about our psychology and the rest of it as well. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And I agree. And I think it's part of why for us to stay relevant as a profession, um, we so you know being a being a, a doctor who has a spinal cord injury we often get into the conversation of why is uh why is this important in medicine to have diverse people 
Um, why is it important to have someone with the spinal cord injury or disability? Well, I think for us to stay relevant and for us to think differently, um, uh, you, you know, through COVID, we saw this time where mm-hmm. society was, our, uh, their trust in us was tested. Yeah. And society has access to information now. It's not the same relationship that we had mm. with humanity 100 years ago. No. So I think for us to stay relevant, um, we have to reflect the society that we live in. Mm-hmm. We have to have the same people. And I think when we have more, uh, the, it, it's been said that if everyone's thinking the same way, mm-hmm. then no one is thinking. Yeah, okay, because it's, it's the same thought, right? It's just a unoriginal ideation. And, uh, exactly. That makes sense. Actually. Um, one thing you did say was, that you think you know disability is a social construct and I, I can absolutely see that like can you la- elaborate on that yeah i have um i uh i think the things that were most disabling to me um that there are there are so many ways around of even a physical environment <laughs> there's there's ways around it so i was um I, I traveled to Korea last year, South Korea, <laughs> and uh, there was uh, there was a lot of different physical barriers. Like the physical environment wasn't always accessible, yeah. But people were always willing to figure out how to work around it. That's great. You know, this is a way we can get around the stairs, or this is yeah. how we can work around the door, or mm-hmm. whatever. So. Um, uh, so I think it's when you have those kind of attitudes in society, um, it's actually less disabling. Yeah. So it's the way we think about stuff rather than the physical environments, I think. And for me, what nearly stopped me from becoming a doctor wasn't wasn't the environment, wasn't the technology, wasn't anything like that. We have all that. Mm-hmm. It was more the attitudes of yeah. people. Because so when you think of any anything really, like on a very like a lower scale in your day-to-day i've woken up with a massive like neck sprain i I just couldn't i needed help i was like you know doing some pediatric cases i was like oh my god i I can barely look down it's a temporary disability but people you know came in to help to uh to make that to mitigate the risk of that and that was an amazing thing and that's just that's just one aspect of it but you can just imagine what you said you know, it's not, it's not a disability. It's it really just, uh, it, you just need a workaround. You just need a team. You just need other solutions to get there. And the cool thing about that is I think um, when you, when you start exploring other solutions, you think actually this works better than yeah. what I was always doing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's been times where I've learned to do things, um, whether it be using technology or otherwise. And I've become faster than my colleagues at doing something. Can you tell me about that? Because that's, I find that really interesting. I think the fact that you, know, you, you, you had to take three hours to get ready for, before your rounds, right? Um, there's only 24 hours in a day. Yeah. How do you, like, what are the efficiencies that you've managed to create to allow this to happen? Or, or do you just need two hours sleep? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's, it's uh, it, it, that's, that's such a good question. So, um, Recently, I was at. Uh, I had the opportunity to um, spend some time with some students and uh, do a couple of talks for them mm-hmm. at a at an Ivy League school in the United States. Mm-hmm. So um, they're amazing students, yeah. and um, one of them, uh, he was wearing two watches, and I said, "Why do you wear two watches?" And he said, "Well, one's a stopwatch because because I want to <laughs> timing everything." Yeah. And I want to, I want to keep an eye on how much time I waste through the day. Oh, I, I mean, I love data, data collection. Like, if you're going to claim anything, you should measure it. Uh, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's impressive. I guess he, that's why he's at that particular institution. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So anyway, it's just, it was just about I um, I streamlined everything in my life. Okay. So, so this uh, is really relevant. Uh, you know, all, a lot of my audience, there'll be medical students or junior doctors sitting exams, seeing the primary exams. You know, there's no time between all the you know, all the work and the shifts and having a social life and watching Netflix. You know, there's a, there's a lot to balance in there. Like how yeah, how do you streamline stuff? Yeah. Um, so, 
I um, was talking to someone recently and they said, hey, I was looking at your LinkedIn and um, you've got where you're working now as a doctor and whatever else, but you've also got the fact that uh, you worked at McDonald's yeah. in your in 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 uh, in your early life, so I, I found that really important mm-hmm. um, because when I worked at McDonald's, it's all a system, right? Yeah, yeah. And they want to be able to get patty, right? Right. yeah. And in 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 ninety seconds, you can produce ten cheeseburgers. That's a lot. Yeah, as an individual, or is it? Yeah, is it a, wow, yeah, yeah, good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that that's the that's the sort of a benchmark. Well, at, at that time, it was. Yeah. So 90 seconds, you could produce 10 cheeseburgers and it's because they had a system. Um, So I learned that. And uh, a friend of mine later said, you know, if you're going to succeed at going back to medical school, you'll have to think about your life either as an athlete and you'll have to structure it in a certain way. So these kind of experiences really stuck in my head. And so I um, streamlined the way I do everything. So at home, things are in a certain place so we can trim off like... Mm -hmm minutes here and there yeah and um the you know but when i wake up and my mom helps me out so there's a certain routine in which the way we 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 do the food and mm-hmm. uh I, I use some of the time around that to reply to emails oh, yeah. so i do that once once a day in the morning um so everything is routine the way i put on my shoes and socks yeah. everything everything is yeah. done uh in in a routine And the good thing about that is I think if I was looking for my socks every morning for two minutes or something like that, that's, that's just like time wasted cognitively where I could be focusing on other more productive things. So, um, I, 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 uh, try to automate as much simple stuff as I can Mm -hmm. in my life. Is your next book going to be productivity? It should be. Hey, <laughs> get, get in with Ali Abdel. Say, hey, I got some advice here. <laughs> oh man, but I was I was forced to do that. You know, I was forced to yeah, necessity. Right? Forced to do that. Yeah, like I, I um, we 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 fly around a lot now as well, <laughs> um, and so there's a pre-packed bag, so even that is a routine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when we need to go, grab the bag from the shed, yeah, and we're on on the way. Yeah, nice. At, at the airport, there's a routine, and it, it's. It's great because you then use your time and uh, cognition to spend focusing on the more important things. Mm. This is very similar to like the checklist manifesto, right? Love just, it. Yeah. yeah. When you say, I've, I've got my travel checklist and I just take 15 minutes to get everything together. And that's probably even a, a long time because I'm like, oh, I got to repack stuff. Mm-hmm. But maybe I need a go bag for either travel or the next COVID pandemic that comes along or whatever. <laughs> totally, man. And then... Uh, I love the checklist manifesto, by the way. Yeah, great, great, great. Cool. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I think it adds up over time, but I was forced to do that because I have a spinal cord injury mm-hmm. and suddenly like about four hours of my day is taken out by just <laughs> surviving, you know, yeah. just doing the basics. So how do I, how do I make sure the rest of it falls into place? But it's, you know, when I think about stuff like that, it's in a way, it's the best thing that ever happened to me because I didn't always think this way. Yeah. yeah. Hey, so um, one of the things I want to ask you, uh, we kind of touched on it. What role do you see technology playing in the future of medicine, especially for people with disabilities? Yeah. Speaking of books, one of the other books that I, I love um, and has been an influence is called The Creative Destruction of Medicine yeah. by Eric Topol. So Eric Topol is a cardiologist at the Cleveland Clinic, and he talks about how we are so. Um, he's actually a, he's he's pretty. Um, he he calls medicine sclerotic and ossified oh, in the in the way as in we're, like we're stagnant. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And in <laughs> in the way we adapt to things, when he talks about all this technology out there, I mean, you know. We still know practices that use fax, right? Yeah, that's it. It's really my hospital uses a fax, and uh... exactly, <laughs> and 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 we send letters for people's appointments. Yeah. Um. Uh, so when there's email and text and all this other stuff, so I think that's something simple like that. Mm. Um. And, and if you're talking about disability, you know, a letter you got to open the envelope, blah blah blah. If you don't have finger function like me, it can be. Mm. 
mm. a little bit tricky, but what if we send a text? Mm. Then we can dictate that text and all, all this stuff. And that's actually so, easy for everyone then as well, isn't it? It's easy for everyone. It's efficient, mm -hmm. saves paper, mm -hmm. it's environmentally friendly, it saves costs, yeah. and it saves all that stuff. But I think um, we, we can start with simple things like that. Mm. A lot of my colleagues use dictation in our hospital now. So yeah. uh, all, the, all the clinical staff have access to dictation. Yeah. So you can just uh, use your phone as the microphone <laughs> and it dictates into the EMR. So I see people just oh, amazing. using it now. Uh, they use shortcuts and everything. But think about the collective amount of time saved yeah. doing that. Like we're all, I don't know, Victorian um, health system in Victoria is already really underfunded now. We're, I think we're having to cut elective lists and some some doctors on temporary contracts have been laid off and it's it's all a bit difficult. But yeah, imagine just this as being the trigger to improve efficiency, which also saves costs for everyone. And it improves access for people like me. Uh, so if we think about going to a paper-based hospital, I think I would spend a lot more time. Mm -hmm. Like I've learned how to write and I've learned how to do all these things, mm -hmm. but for me to mess around with paper charts and things would be yeah. a lot more complex, but having the EMR yeah. has really enabled me to work more efficiently. So I think apart from cost savings, I think apart from mm -hmm. making the healthcare system more efficient, it improves access for a broader range of people to do medicine. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when when we talk about medical practice broadly, we look at all these big solutions, right? We, we think about AI as a big thing. We do these big mm -hmm. randomized controlled trials to see what drug might work better than another. Yeah. But actually, um, I love the idea of the aggregation of marginal gains. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's the little things that we're, let's not send a fax. Mm -hmm. uh, let's not send a letter. Yeah. Let's get everyone to dictate their notes mm -hmm. so they might save how, how many how many hours a day collectively, right? So yeah. I think all these things can actually lead to a point where we don't have to lay off doctors or where we don't have to mm. do all that. So um, how about the, like those are the low kind of the low level fruit mm. that I think could be yeah, could done reasonably easy, especially if systems are progressive and want to adapt quickly. Like, um, you know, one of my mates from back in med school, like, you know, he's off in Silicon Valley creating, I think, Stentrode with his company um, and, you know, being able to, like, what, what do you see, um, like, you know, your your brain being able to control parts of your body? Is, is that the holy grail? Is that? I actually do uh, this kind of work in our own lab. So, yeah, nice. yeah we, we do EEG-driven rehab. Yeah. Um, so in our work, we uh, train people to walk, um, and we use uh, either a cycle or, or uh, a VR avatar. We got, we're working on some exoskeletons and we're walking machines at mm -hmm. the moment. So it's thought controlled. Yeah. Um, how far do you think are we away from a minimum viable product? Doing it now. We're doing yeah, it now. Right. So um, a couple of years ago, someone was driving a Tesla with just the off the shelf yep. EEG device. Really? Yeah. Um, so you can see it on YouTube. There's a video of someone yeah. using this. So it, it's there now. Um, and if you look at actually uh, not just what Stentrode is doing, but uh, Elon Musk's mm -hmm. uh, group. Um, and if you look at some of the interviews from this guy, like it's it's mm -hmm. really interesting to see his feedback on what it's like to use yeah, right. thought control. And actually, I mean, I know there's a lot of engineering behind the, the the work and we have engineers in our lab that put a lot of work into making sure that the system works. But mm -hmm. the concept is not that complex. Yeah. You're picking up signals from the brain. And transcribing it into... You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. As soon as it becomes digital and electrical, you can hopefully convert that to something useful. And yeah. Exactly. Um, and... With relation to spinal cord injury, there have been some studies done that show this can um, restore some motor function in individuals. So that's what we're working towards. Okay. But eventually, I think in medical practice, um, we have, uh, I have colleagues that have remotely done procedures using robotics yeah, from, from one center to another as, as a proof of concept. Yes. 
Um, so I think for medicine, uh, things like thought control and robotics, and this is so much potential for us to do our jobs better. Yeah. But I think the the it's contingent on us not holding on to the past. Yeah. And that's the hardest thing because there's so much in, I don't know if it's just investment or uh, like, especially when you're part of big organizations, it feels like it's it's difficult for them through whatever systematic structures that are existing to change. It's not like there's this sudden, like, um, you know, if you've got startup culture, you just get it, you just do it, you fail fast, and then you keep going. And I, I just wish there was, I, I, like, I like the idea of the security of big organizations, that they're stable and secure, but I wish there was a, a place where they would rapidly change and rapidly fail as well, whilst keeping the, you know, keeping the good things of that. Um, yeah, no, I agree. And I think the challenge for us in Australia, I feel like it's a bit different in the US, mm-hmm. but the challenge for us in Australia is that we work for public hospitals mostly. Yeah. Um, and otherwise the private hospitals that we work for are very um, streamlined towards profits. Yeah. And so where, where does that leave the opportunity for innovation? Um, even the universities are mm-hmm. still quite conservative. Whereas I think in places like the US, um, they're forced to innovate and they're incentivized to innovate. Yeah. And, and so many things come out of those places. So I think perhaps we need a better environment to do that in. Yeah, and I think they do try it with their there's an innovation subject in you know, Melbourne called the Biodesign something. And, and that's good. Like they, you know, they take in students from biomedical and engineering and business and they collaborate together and try to do something. I think that's a, a really good starting point. Um, yeah, It's again why we need a, a diversity of thought in medicine. Yeah, um, We need to have people. That's why post-grad medicine, I think, is a beautiful in a way because we can attract. I, I've gone to medical school with people who did engineering mm. and um, did all these other disciplines, and I think that's a really nice... A uh, way for us to start thinking differently yeah. about the things that we do, um, because we we are rapidly changing, mm. and I think actually some specialties as well they're they're um, losing relevance to other professions that might surround them mm-hmm. by not adapting quickly enough. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, I, th- I think there's a lot of room for us to think differently. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, what are the things you've had to modify? Like just on, again, a database, like, you know, examination and yeah. history taking, even like busy ward rounds. Like, did you have, yeah. like, you know, I know that when I was doing a ward round, it's like rapidly writing stuff and tra- chasing after the consultants who are already, you know, meet, meet us down the hallway. Like, how, how did you adjust to all these little things during your, during your internship? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I just thought about the workflow. Uh, and I thought about when I was an intern, I was like, okay, what does an intern uh, need to do in the morning? <laughs> Get the list ready. So um, I, had, I, the hospital gave me access at home yeah. through a device. So while, um, while my mum was helping me with breakfast, yes. I did the patient list. Ah, I uh, lost that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I, I got the I got the results. I made a list, and it, and I tried to make a really good list. Yeah. And um, then I took that off the hands of my colleagues, mm-hmm. so they could do other things. So I always made the list because I'm like, okay, you know, this is something I can do. Yes. So let me take this off your hands, and you can. Oh, that's great. Do fun stuff. Just share the responsibilities, yeah. but do what you can do best. And, yeah. Yeah. And so um, got the list uh, ready, and then. Um, I took an iPad, so I was in the coffee line mm-hmm. once, and there was the. Uh, I ran into the person who gave us the orientation to EMR. Yeah, I said, "Do you reckon I could ever get this on on an iPad?" Yeah. And uh, she said, "Yeah, like I can set this up for you on an iPad." Yeah. So then I had um, EMR on the iPad. Yes. So when we were doing a surgical rotation or somewhere where the ward rounds are really quick yeah. and fast, um, this was a real. <laughs> advantage because it's like oh 
what's the result for this patient? I could I could pull up the bloods yeah, right. on my iPad. And you were the only one with the iPad in that. Yeah. Yeah, good, good. yeah. And I was doing all the notes on it. Yeah. It was already done when the ward rounds finished. Um, and I scanned the um I scanned blood forms and things because we still had some paper back then. Yep. So I scanned the blood and imaging forms into my iPad and made it into fillable PDFs. Uh, right. And then uh, when we needed to order some on the round, I um, I just filled the form. Yeah. And then I worked out how to print it to the nearest printer remotely. <laughs> so all the forms would just spit out. And So you were more efficient than I was, is what you're saying. It's tried. <laughs> yeah, tried. <laughs> I mean, there's almost like an argument for... Yeah, it sounds weird to say, give yourself a handicap, a disability, or some kind of obstruction to see how you'll work around it. And that is the, that's how you innovate. Like, like that's what you were doing, essentially. Well, I was forced to, I had to. Yeah. I, I wanted to, and I wanted to prove myself and I wanted to. So, uh, yeah, those, those were some of the, um, some of the, I guess, like really impactful things for me. But um, even when I was examining a patient, I had to think, okay, how am I going to make this more efficient? So I thought about what angle I will approach the patient's bed from, uh, how will I take the history, which which doesn't really matter because, mm -hmm. you know, it's just normal. But um, in terms of examining a patient, to, to do a neuro exam, for example, I thought about where I will have the tendon hammer mm -hmm. on, on the wheelchair um, how will I sit the patient? How will I yeah. do all this? So actually most of the time, unless, um, there's a procedure, complex procedure required in the emergency department, I'm independent because it's not hard to put a stethoscope on someone. Um, it's not hard to do a neuro exam on someone. So it's only if there's a PR exam or a yeah. PV exam, which I'm happy to yeah, that's what I was yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, so you're just getting out of the things you do want to do. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you, I use the spinal cord injury. Yeah, yeah. Just, up, just leveraging that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I think, is it, uh, you did mention that a nurse, kind of the IV cannulation the yeah. educator, taught you how to cannulate in a different way to allow you to do it. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. So it's, again, it's, it was being a bit more intentional mm -hmm. with how I would set, set things up. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, the, those little bedside tables that patients have there. Yeah. Like the um, yeah. Mayo stand type. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're amazing because you just clean it up, put a blue on it, put the patient's arm on it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I just needed someone to help open up the mm -hmm. equipment and stick a pair of gloves on me. And then I just figured out, so I can just maneuver a cannula in with the way my fingers naturally sit now. Yeah. And so I just learned how to advance it and, oh, good. and get it in. And, um, the, and the grip to hold and in, in, insert the skin, it was all doable. You actually don't need that much force. No, it's sharp. <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. It's sharp. So, um, so one of my friends, one of my close friends, who's um, doing his fellowship exams for anesthetics now, All right. I remember talking to him when I was a student <laughs> and I said, okay, so I figured out, today I figured out how to put a cannula into a mannequin. Yeah. And um, I was doing this for over and over again for a couple of months. <laughs> And I said, yeah, that's, it's cool. And, and I never entertained the idea of doing it on a patient. Yeah. And he said, well, why not? Because that's what we all do. Yeah. We do it on a mannequin and we do it on a patient. Yeah. Why is it different for you? Mm. I was like, yeah, actually, <laughs> you're right. I just didn't think about it that way. Yeah. And so I was uh, doing renal at the time and um, I just thought, okay, I'll, I'll put a cannula in. And so I did it. And, um, the lady, the patient, we were all stoked. Yeah. That we, <laughs> and she's like, do you want a photo of it? Um, so I actually got a photo of the first cannula that I ever put in. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you send that to me. That would be good. <laughs> yeah. it, it is funny because I think, uh, you know, with, with YouTube, that's the one thing that so many people watch. You know, I could be teaching some really nuanced thing about crisis management or pathophysiology. Hundred people watch that, you know. Whatever cannulation, people love that. Really? 
Yeah, it's, it's just a really big, I guess, market. You know, real like how interesting. Kind of a, I guess, a lower level level skill from the general point of view. Though I think it's the highest level skill. Like you know, when you need to get that cannula in, and all you've got is a tiny vein, and it's a resus kind of thing, and that's that, that's the one thing you really need. Like ASAP. Yeah, minutes ago. And I've been there as a patient. Yeah, where, yeah. You know, where they really struggled, and I. Think you know, try my forehead at some point. Some yeah, point. you've done that. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. there's always there's. Yeah, I know I've got a really nice little vein here. Like, hey, should I ever get into trouble? That's the one to go for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, obviously, ABC's anesthesia is a lot about medical education, and um, just in general, talking about innovation or disability. Mm. Um, is there anything you see that could be, you know? generally universities or even you know um youtubers like myself sh should be doing for disability or from an innovation point of view yeah i i um i think there are more medical students with disability coming through now mm -hmm. um and i know of quite a few with spinal cord injuries that are either doctors or, or medical students coming through yeah and in fact there are a couple of anesthetists with spinal cord injuries as well oh, um, nice. floating around yeah um i don't know what their work life looks like yeah um but uh yeah so <laughs> i really do think when it comes to education it's easy to teach like mm -hmm. it's easy to the, teach the straightforward students right like 90 mm percent -hmm. you got the yeah. yes take them through this, do it all over again. Yes. But I think it's way more interesting to do something different yes. to, to people like, you know, like when I was going through medical school, it was a bit different and had different challenges. Mm -hmm. I think as educators, it's more interesting and more rewarding to troubleshoot that. Yeah. yeah. Um, because, you know, we can do the same thing every day. Like it's not yeah. that exciting. Right? Yeah. It's always rewarding. But <laughs> Um, so I think it, I think I would like to see people embrace the bigger challenges mm -hmm. and inclusion. I think, you know, I, I, I come across discourse sometimes where, where people say, Hey, it's a buzzword. It's a, mm -hmm. you know, why do we need to do it? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. But I think there are a lot of whys about, uh, disability inclusion in particular, mm -hmm. Um, because that's that's where I come from. Yeah. Um, why that's important, and it's because you know it helps us to think differently. Mm. It uh, allows us to reflect our community because one in six people on this planet have disability. Yeah. Um, and we're investing so much money in the NDIS. Yeah. So for it to have it make economic sense, yes, it's about getting people to participate and work and be educated and things like that. So I'd love for us to think a bit differently about um uh how we can include more people in medical education yeah how we can increase the diversity mm -hmm. of people in medical education and actually to rethink so one of, for example one of the conversations that kept coming up is what if you need to do cpr mm -hmm. well how many people you know if you take a thousand doctors how many of them actually need to do it <laughs> and how many would have done it in the last year yeah but um so so and also the fact that you can, if there's people around, it's a, you know, you can teach that. You can, and you can, you can get one of those Lucas machines on eventually as well. Yeah. yeah. So is medicine reduced to doing something like CPR? Like, is that our, is that the most important skill that a doctor needs to have? Yeah. Or like, sh um, should we be thinking a bit differently mm -hmm. about, and, and these are the questions that we're forced to face mm -hmm. when, when, you have someone like me coming through medical school. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I noticed over the years where, uh, you know, I've been in the, the system and been with my college for many years now. And, you know, I, I know that it's, it's, it's individuals who've got a different circumstance that have had to kind of talk up to power and say, hey, I'm going to knock on the door and I'm not going to stop knocking until there's some level of, a, you know, a reasonable answer for my unique situation. Like it would be nice if there was the ability when unique things or maybe different things or things they haven't addressed before happens, that there's a mechanism that's could err on the side of, I don't know, some level of generosity or openness to 
courage. courage. Yeah, courage to action that first and then not leave people in the lurch for so long because time is absolutely precious. Um, and how long are we going to keep doing the same thing, right? Like are we yeah. really not going to change and adapt? Yeah. Are we really not because we're, 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 we've been, I mean, when you think back historically, you think about when when women were able to practice medicine. Like, yeah, wasn't that long ago in history? Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, so um, so we need to really adapt if we are to stay relevant mm-hmm. and trusted. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting point, isn't it? Um, yeah, and I, I can just imagine a world where you med- I mean, definitely learning or medical education, which is very much an intellectual pursuit most of the time can be you know done you know with many many different types of media and very and you know systems that allow you to learn something rapidly and also learn relevant things and not the irrelevant things which is also a real constraint of medicine and the, just the amount of knowledge you have to learn and 90 percent of it is like ah oh, do, 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 do i really need to know that <laughs> so true um yeah so uh, yeah I, I think this is time we because it's also um, information can be accessed really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, when, I, when I actually started medical school in 2008, mm-hmm. um, uh, rivaroxaban wasn't the thing. Mm-hmm. So we were learning the ins and outs of warfarin and... Uh, uh, and, 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 and it's complex, right? <laughs> yeah. But then um, when I came back to medical school yeah. after the accident four years later, there was rivaroxaban. Yeah. So... Um, but those, so things will always change and that information is always going to be accessible mm-hmm. on our, on our palms now, right? Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, whereas actually when I started medical school, that was the first year the iPhone came out. Yes. So even then information wasn't as readily accessible yeah. as it is today. Yes. People still had, um, very basic phones mostly. Yes. So I think, um, these days, what we need to teach people is not so much information, but more principles, how to think, mm. um, and because all, all those things are like, you know, it's something that you learn could be out of date next year. That's right. I mean, it's just reflected in your practice. Like as long as I've got my iPhone, which has the all the knowledge of the world at its fingertips, <laughs> then then I just need to know the principles and understand understand how things work. The rest is you just fill in the gaps. Assessment, history, examination, investigation, doctor's ABCDE, management is always, you know, um, you know, and, you know pharmacological, non pharm interventional, surgical. It's 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 just frameworks. Yeah. Yeah. And and things like basic physiology are important. I think like all, all those kind of things lay the foundation. Yeah. But those other other bits and pieces I think are are so rapidly changing yeah yeah Ash, we're coming up to the time and uh i've got to catch this flight but i was i wanted to ask you what message uh would you like to share with listeners about resilience and her becoming adversity <laughs> that that's might be a, a long question but yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a big question um there are probably a couple of things uh and these are things that are often um often talk about when it comes to resilience. So uh, one is it was said that a person who has a why to live can bear almost anyhow. <laughs> For me, I really do love medicine, the, <laughs> the art and science of it. And because I loved it so much, it's what gave me the strength to continue it's what gives me the energy to go to the hospital every day and do the job. So having that why and and coming back to the root of why we're here, I think gives us gives us strength. Mm-hmm. So for me, um, it, it, for me, it's that. And I think when we're having a hard day at work, when we're having a tough time with the systems or whatever, mm-hmm. just thinking back to why we're there, which actually is for another human being, for yeah. a patient, I think is is important. Um, and you and I, we've come from a place that is difficult for many people. Yeah. It's a reality. Yeah. It's a place that was at war. It's a place where poverty is still an issue. Mm-hmm. It's a place where people can't eat. And so, uh, the other two things is having a sense of 
perspective and gratitude about how lucky we are. Yeah. Uh, and it's a practice thing, isn't it? Like you've got to remind yourself constantly. It's not, and that's not easy to do because it's easy to have that negativity bias about most things, I think. Yeah. I mean, you and I are sitting here in Gold Coast. Yeah. <laughs> We've eaten with, you yeah. know, you're going to catch a flight. Like, yeah, it's, it's pretty wild, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, gratitude and perspective. And I think those are some of the things that have, um, have been helpful to me to, to give me strength. And I guess the last thing is um, we hang on to so many things in our lives so tightly. Mm-hmm. And again, going back to Buddhism, it, it says that attachment is one of the ways of suffering. Mm-hmm. I was so attached to my life until this happened. But um, letting go taught me that uh, as, as this poem once said, mm-hmm. that my barn having burnt down, I can finally see the moon. Mm-hmm. So sometimes to see the moon, we just have to let go. Yeah. That's a beautiful way to end it. Dinesh. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I can't thank you enough for making the time because I know that is an effort and uh, yeah, just really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. No, no worries. It's, uh, it's been great to catch up and I'm so glad we finally made it happen. I know, that's great. And I hope we'll have many more talks over the years. So totally. it's that. Um, hey guys, thanks very much, very much for listening. Please share with anyone who might be interested and we'll catch you for the next episode soon. Thanks. Now, what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey, from medical student to procedural skills, from foundations in anesthesia, as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well. 